agrarian transformation in Yunnan province. And she is currently engaged in questions of provincial transformation, especially in Yunnan. Dr. Agar Agarwal studied Mandarin Chinese from Peiching Language and Cultural University. She was also a visiting scholar at the Yunnan Academy of Social Sciences and a visiting fellow at Yunnan Minsu University and Yunnan University recently. Chairing the session is Professor Manuranjan Mohanty, Emeritus Fellow and former Chairperson, Institute of Chinese Studies, Distinguished Professor, Council for Social Development, and former Professor, University of Delhi. His recent publications include Ideology Matters, China from Mao Zedong to Xi Jinping, published in 2016, the Hindi edition of which came out last year, and China's Transformation, The Success Story and Success Trap, based on a 30-year study of China's reform with focus on Wu Xi. Its Hindi edition was published by Sage in 2020. Before I invite the chair to begin the proceedings, I would like to remind our participants that during the duration of the event, all participants except the speaker shall remain muted. Participants are requested to send in their queries via the chat box or use the raise hand option. Please unmute yourself only when called upon to do so by the chair. I will now invite Professor Mohanty to begin the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Rija. I'm very pleased to uh, chair this session uh, by someone who uh, has studied this problem for many, many years. I remember Ritu joined ICS when ICS was in Bhagwan Das Road. I think uh, Rija, Sruti, uh, they, they should remember you know, how these connections grow into uh, some of you becoming important experts. So I'm very pleased. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Yunnan, like uh, Ushi in my case, Yunnan in case of Ritu has become the second home. <laughs> um, and uh, she goes back there very often. She lectures in Chinese in uh, Yunnan uh, meetings. Uh, and uh, so, I, and we get excellent reports. And she conducted a, a conference on Yunnan studies uh, a couple of years ago. I think a book is in the making. So uh, that's Ritu Agrawal, um, uh, a uh, serious product of ICS programs uh, and uh, uh, now uh, a budding uh, expert, <coughs> already <laughs> um, an expert. Now the topic, and uh, as uh, Rija said, this is part of our very interesting, very significant project. Uh, initiated uh, by several of us, led by uh, Ambassador Kishanrana, and uh, on China's domestic governance. As you know, several of us uh, have uh, insisted that uh, uh, we uh, we should have, uh, you know, good expertise on domestic dimensions, uh, politics, economy, society, culture, literature, and so on. Uh, along with foreign policy and security, which are uh, bound to be very important dimensions of ICS uh, and Indian interest in China. Uh, and therefore, this uh, um, new initiative really consolidates uh, three generations of research on domestic dimensions of China's Chinese studies. Uh, and therefore, I'm very pleased uh, to have this as the second important contribution. Um, I would just say one thing, uh, you know, when uh, uh, it was announced that uh, the achievement of the first centenary goal in 2020, uh, declared so in 2021 on the 100th uh, anniversary of the founding of the CPC, uh, uh, the single important thing that was highlighted was poverty eradication. Uh, but what did they mean really by it? They meant absolute poverty eradication. I will leave uh, the subject to Ritu, of course, to dwell upon. We will we look forward to that. But I want to say that, uh, please remember, poverty is not a uh, universally agreed, um, defined concept. Remember the Indian debate. We started in 67. Dandekaran Rath, uh, you know, calorie intake. 
Then we came to uh, poverty count, uh, head count poverty, uh, according to that, plus bringing in income. Now, uh, then for a long time, even now, income poverty, that is a monthly uh, income and uh, now extended to monthly per capita expenditure uh, uh, on uh, essential items. That becomes the indication. But when uh, UNDP adopted the multidimensional definition of first development, then of poverty, uh, we saw uh, some improvement. And, uh, you know, I have been part of the CSD exercise of social development, where we directly address this question uh, in Council for Social Development's uh, biannual reports, India Social Development Report, uh, six of which have been published every two years. So, uh, and the most interesting thing is the latest definition of human development according to UNDP, as was mentioned in their latest report, is climate change adjusted human development including poverty eradication. Therefore, when they claim that they have achieved this great goal, true, it is, it is a great achievement. I mean, something like uh, at least 500 million have been lifted out of uh, absolute poverty during the last 20 years. Uh, and in 40 years, even more. So uh, it is an achievement, but one should not bloat about this because poverty is connected with inequalities of many kinds. And therefore, uh, one has to be humble about uh, addressing poverty eradication question. With these, I look forward to um, <clears throat> the presentation by Ritu Agrawal. Ritu. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And with such a great introduction, I think uh, I just have to say that I'm happy to be back at ICS. Uh, well, this is a part of, as I said, as Sarah also has mentioned, uh, domestic governance uh, project. And I'm writing another, you know, something on county governance to be, you know, associated, to be related to that. But anyway, to begin the story, as Professor Mohanty has rightly mentioned, that, uh, you know, the so much success stories about uh, Xi Jinping's uh, poverty elevation project. And everywhere you will see a big story everywhere going around that China has eradicated, China has you know, uh, lifted out so many millions of population out of poverty. So you have you know, people from development studies, people from you know, international media, and uh, all kinds of uh, scholars are basically trying to figure it out that uh, what is it, uh, you know, the elevation of poverty with Chinese Xi Jinping has been, you know, President Xi Jinping has been talking about. So, uh, you know, as to just uh, give a, a briefly a kind of, you know, couple of things, it was basically since the 18th party Congress, uh, Xi Jinping has made this uh, poverty alleviation as a main uh, national priority agenda. And the main idea was basically to build a moderately prosperous well of society. And the entire uh, poverty elevation program began like a, uh, you know, in a mode of mass campaign. And, you know, the, the idea of us basically to create awareness, to create a kind of a effective policy intervention, in, uh, you know, in local areas at the provincial level, township level, to that extent that even in the inner lanes of uh, township in Yunnan province in one county, I could see wall posters, you know, big boards and uh, everywhere wall writing talking about that, what is this about you know, the Xi Jinping's uh, uh, poverty eradication program? So it has reached to uh, you know, all uh, even insights and uh, inside uh, regions of China, provinces, township and counties with all this public awareness campaign that it is very important for, to eradicate the uh, poverty, uh, especially the Xi Jinping model. So after saying that, uh, well, this paper uh, uh, is looking at what are the uh, measures as well as the criteria or you can say indicators taken by the uh, Chinese government to identify the poor population, or how do they designate the regions which are considered to be poor. Second point, which I want to uh, look into this presentation is, uh, what has been the provincial, I mean, why after so many years of uh, poverty eradication program, poverty still persists in Yunnan. 
So what have been the, you know, the development strategies of a provincial government in Yunnan, which has not, you know, need to reformulate in terms of China's national level poverty indicators. And third point, of course, I would like to, uh, like to talk about is my own field, ex field experience in Luchuan County, uh, where I would like to talk about that how uh, through the you know, discussion of three components, that how uh, poverty looks like in an ethnically dominated region is a kind of a imposed economic modernization program for the ethnic minorities, which may not be a kind of a, a sustainable approach for the livelihood of ethnic minorities uh, population in that region. So begin with the first point, what is the important measurement as well as the indicators taken by the Chinese government to identify the poor population? So in that case, uh, the one important uh, point is poverty in China is often considered to be a ruler problem. So we always indicate that uh, basically the poverty is concentrated mainly in the rural areas of China. Second important point is that poverty seem to be uh, uh, concentrated in margins. And that margins can be understood either in terms of geographical margins or in terms of a uh, regions where ethnic minorities uh, live in a great number. So this is how they consider as a geographical concentration of uh, uh, ethnic minorities or the regions which are located in the mountainous areas of China or you know, which is basically not so well connected. And then, so therefore, you know, there were series of studies talk about that how power, poverty is concentrated in resource poor regions of China, North, Northwest and Southwest. Then and another important point is that the household income, which Professor Mohanty was talking about, household income is taken as a kind of a single criterion to assess the poverty. So basically, uh, but in case of China, we don't get this, uh, you know, the household income is not related to the levels of nutrition. So normally uh, what you get to know is that what has been the household income, uh, and on the basis of that, the poverty, uh, uh, you know, um, poverty threshold has been uh, determined. So in that context, uh, uh, there was a series of, uh, uh, you know, changes. And earlier, um, I remember it was in 1986. It was 206 yuan, and now it has raised to uh, 2,300, and they are thinking of raising further to 4,000 yuan uh, per capita income. So, you know, the whole point is that when you talk about uh, only income as a kind of a criterion, you don't take into account various other factors like, you know, nutrition levels, energy requirement, or gender, age, health, education, to basically look at the, uh, you know, poverty threshold. Another interesting point is that in China, it looks like the poverty uh, threshold is determined on the basis of, uh, you know, uh, geography, as I indicated earlier. So there is a kind of this concept of understanding the impact of poverty elevation program on the basis of counties. So counties has been chosen. So there are something like, as I mentioned, uh, 500 uh, plus counties, which have been designated by the Chinese government as poor counties. So, you know, the whole idea of when you designate counties as a poor, uh, you know, uh, regions, the whole issue is that who has given this task of assessment? Assessment in the sense, you know, finding out that uh, who are the poor living in these counties and how poor they are. So basically the whole idea is that the entire assessment of poverty or poor population was left to the county government or the local government in China to basically identify and estimate that how many poor are there and how much poor the poor population is. So basically, you know, uh, poverty is targeted geographically. And also, uh, you know, there's a whole concept of, there's a whole problem of classification. So many times what happened is that the poverty elevation schemes, which was earlier based on, uh, uh, you know, uh, allocating fund to these areas or basically transferring some kind of a help to these areas, only limited to a certain household in those regions, but it did not often reach to the non-poor, uh, uh, or so it only reached to the non-poor household to the region, but did not reach to the poor household of the region. So there's all this problem. So basically I'm trying to tell you is that the complexities and the problems was in identifying as well as counting, as well as measuring the poor population, which China has been doing since 1980 so far. And there were a lot of complexities with that. 
and now xi jinping's new idea of uh, you know he gave this new idea of targeted poverty alleviation program where he want people to cure poverty by linking agriculture with industrial development identify which is the real population making this uh, village party secretaries as well as township officials to go for a household repeated visits and find out who are the real poor so that the benefit of the poor population should reach uh, to the uh, you know right beneficiaries anyway i can i can come to this part uh, later um, let me go back to now uh, uh, yunnan province that when we apply this kind of a criteria to yunnan province how it is important uh, in that context to reformulate the poverty threshold or what you call you know the poverty line and how uh, the yunnan uh, situation has further complicated uh, this uh, uh, poverty uh, you know measurement which china has uh, tried to formulate time to from time to time so let me show you the map of yunnan uh, to begin with uh, just uh, just a second um, yeah so basically if you look at uh, yunnan poverty uh, you know how the poverty in yunnan is concentrated so it looks like that in yunnan there are double or triple burdens of poverty so which means that there are entire you know there is entire mountainous regions where poverty is concentrated which uh, local government has argued that they are not connected with the um, you know with the with the roads and infrastructure development therefore they are poor second is that you know the entire forest regions so you have a huge forest cover which is basically people say is also uh, you know designated as poor poor uh, regions then uh, there are border areas uh, which is considered to be poor and then there are ethnically dominated autonomous prefectures counties township villages which is also been uh, designated as a kind of a poor regions in yunnan so if you look at it for example in this map uh you know the kunming so there is something like mountainous regions uh wumang uh, mountain and in this region you have normally uh, you know this is kunming right so you have this kunming uh then you have luchuan which is north of uh, north of kunming and then uh, then also you have uh, uh, shuntuan uh, chuching chuching is here here right so basically i'm just telling you that you know giving you a rough idea so in this central part of china basically uh, luchuan uh, shuntian uh, chuching and this entire chaotong so this is the considered you know chaotong is considered to be the most poor region i mean cities with the township and towns and villages in yunnan where most of this uh, population uh, you know considered to be you know poor population basically residing in this area so chaotong is considered to be Uh, and you also have this chushio now the problem is that uh, this area this central part is considered to be uh, the region where yunnan provincial government has claimed that they are able to get the most effective results of poverty alleviation program right second uh, you know uh, second identification or second you know the the category in this yunnan uh, classification of poverty is that you know the entire rocky and deserted area and where the effect of poverty poverty alleviation program has been very minimal so you have uh, normally you know this hungha and uh, wanshan uh, is considered to be chuching so chuching uh, some portion of chuching uh, hungha and wanshan uh, is also considered to be some of these areas where the results of poverty alleviation has not been successful so far this is hungha right this is hungha this is wanshan so this part of this uh, kunming hungha uh, hanizu uh, uh, izu zhejiao and the wanshan juangzu miaozu zhejiao this consider to be the areas where poverty alleviation result have not been successful then the third classification they have done is a kind of a border areas now border areas include you know uh, paoshan li paoshan you know and then you have this lijiang this is lijiang uh, then you have uh, hungha shishuang panna tali i mean the reason is that why these areas the government claims have not been able to lift it out of poverty and the reason they say is because there are so many poor population and you know because the reason is that some of the areas have been inhabited by number of ethnic minorities 
And that's one reason that uh, they are not able to uh, lift the population out of poverty in those areas. So let me go to the next slide. Okay. Miller. Maybe I have to go back. That is map. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, this is something which I just uh, made a kind of a, you know, Yunnan, Shang, Pengkun, Xi, and Mingtan. So, 88 counties they have designated as a poor counties. So, in every city, Kunming, uh, Chuqing, Chao Tong, Yingxiong, uh, Hungha, Wanshan, and, you know, uh, Hung and uh, Pao Shan, Li Jiang, Pu He, Lan Chang. Okay. So, after giving this account, uh, I also want to show this map basically to indicate that how Yunnan has connected uh, to the other neighboring countries. So you have this new approach of that Yunnan is not only uh, you know internally connected, but you have also the you know, opening up to the neighbors in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So this is a different story, but I thought I'll just bring it because I'll come back to it towards the uh, later, towards the end. Now, uh, so what is the problem with the uh, uh, development strategy of Yunnan in the sense that even after so many years of uh, uh, 1980s, when they started this uh, uh, development strategy of uh, uh, bringing Yunnan into the mainstream development, uh, what have been the problem with the development strategy and why the, uh, the, the results of poverty elevation or, you know, the thing is that even when the province has become economically prosperous, and province has become economically developed comparatively, even after the results of, uh, or the, you know, the, the, is, or the benefits of those economic development and growth has not reached to the uh, native population or the inhabitants of the various uh, cities and township in China. So what have been the problem with the development strategy of Yunnan province? And for that, uh, uh, you know, one has to really uh, keep into mind uh, the role of the provincial governors and, uh, uh, you know, uh, He Chir Chiang and why I made, brought these two provincial leaders uh, into that analysis, because Yunnan uh, provincial development strategies have been, has been very different in the context, uh, in the sense that uh, these two leaders has, in fact, were in power in Yunnan for almost 10 years or more than 10 years. And therefore, the Yunnan development strategies has been affected largely uh, by the policies and program they have adopted or the development strategy they have adopted for the Yunnan provincial development. So Ho Chiang, uh, uh, who was a governor of Yunnan 80, from 85 to 1998, uh, almost more than 10 years, and Pu Chaozu uh, was, of course, governor for two years, but he was a party secretary for almost 10 years. And Whatever is, you know, important to know about the provincial development policies, these two governors have played an important role. And somehow, uh, from 1980s onwards, the provincial development strategy was focused on Toy Bai Khai Fan. So it was basically, you know, uh, uh, oriented towards the, uh, the outward development or development towards the, you know, uh, focusing not on internal development much, but focusing on the building up connections, creating connectivity, establish kind of a, you know, connecting Yunnan to the nearby neighboring countries. While the other provinces in the Western regions, as many people have argued, were focusing on the internal development strategies. So basically uh, the development approach of Yunnan has been driven towards the macro uh, development kind of a regional development approach. That is one. Second important point is that in, in the, kind of a strategy they have adopted was basically based on uh, the central the central part of uh, Yunnan, basically connecting Kunming, Chujing, and uh, Yushi as a kind of a central economic belt, or you know uh, making Yunnan as a kind of a great tobacco kingdom. So you have this uh, rise of Yushi prefecture as an important uh, brand of Hungtha uh, tobacco group. And also third is uh, making a kind of a tourism. So tourism, tobacco, of course, border trade, and uh, making Kunming as a kind of an international city. That was a kind of an important development strategies adopted by these two important leaders uh, in their tenure from 1980s to 90, almost you know, for more than 10 years. And therefore, uh, the, since it was 
either because of one can argue that you know either because of the central government uh, uh, kind of a you know focus on yunnan as an important center because of the you know connectivity because it was you know uh, historical linkages or regional importance or a kind of a you know the provincial his historical narrative which uh, yunnan had the focus was more on building uh, yunnan development on these three four fronts so which three four front i talked about basically uh, making kunming as a kind of a international uh, uh, important uh, city so i i gave you one example where you know the you have the series of uh, uh, you know important documents where it was uh, it was written as well as it has been mentioned that how yunnan provincial governors time to time went to beijing meet you know the president and the vice vice premier there basically to make have a kind of a bargain uh you know to make a kunming as a kind of a important city uh, which can be used for a trading center or become a kind of a international hub or become a kind of a important logistic center so either you know it all based on kind of a uh, bargaining policies between a uh, local government and the central government a and b because the central government wanted to promote this kind of uh, strategies for yunnan which is different from other western parts of china and the provincial government have basically further elaborated or further you know work towards building up those connectivity issues or those you know development issues so the so why i'm saying all these thing the growth in that region remained or limited to the non poor parts of uh, province and the poorer poorer parts of the province which were earlier could have been got the benefit of economic development remained poor as such or the development strategies were strategies were like that that they were not able to participate on those kind of a development program so you know i have all this uh, you know tobacco and of course i can come back later but uh, main is kind of a trade uh, and you know the even the in the trade and tourism for example in terms of tourism industry as well uh, the tourism sites which were chosen by the provincial government and how they have bargained with the uh you know that then that time china tourism uh, leadership for example you know uh, state tourism bureau state tourism bureau chief or the vice premier chen chechen and they made him to come to yunnan and try to you know make him to basically approve the tourism sites which were basically uh, you know suggested by the provincial government so there is a lot of uh, bargaining as well as approving and as well as a kind of a you know um, a series of preferential policies which were uh, formulated by the central government in consultation with the with the provincial government and the ultimate result have been that uh, that the benefit of the growth did, did not reach to the uh, poorer regions of uh, yunnan and therefore you have this kind of a situation in in the province uh, where the even after so many years of 1980 so uh, till now Uh, the poverty still persist and you still have 88 uh, counties and in 88 counties also uh, there are national level counties there are state uh, there are provincial level counties so there is like you know the counties which are designated designated by the uh, by the by by the by the central government and then there are counties which are designated by the provincial government so you know the whole idea is that even after so many efforts and as well as where yunnan was able to make a kind of a complete contribution to economic development but uh, poverty still persists in chai in yunnan the reason was basically the growth was mainly uh, macro development uh, driven and the benefit did not reach to the non poor uh, sorry only reached to the poor regions of yunnan and did not affected the uh, poorer uh, parts of um, the province now that i come to the third part which is basically talking about uh, uh you know luchian county uh, the the area where i actually went on a uh, went on a field work uh, some uh, you know 2018 and the main point which i have uh, you know the what i have tried to look at the uh, you know poverty elevation uh, uh, program in luchian county uh, the pro the township government has taken a much comprehensive approach uh, in that county to address the poverty issues so they they try to relate the uh, poverty rural poverty basically with the uh, vocational education uh, health 
as well as the employment purposes. So this is something like, you know, very interesting about this uh, uh, township government poverty elevation program where they have tried to take a kind of a comprehensive view about uh, poverty elevation. And uh, so this Lucian County, uh, and what is so interesting about uh, uh, this uh, township where I visited, it was basically inhabit inhabited by the ethnic minorities group, E and Meow. And interestingly, uh, this county seems to having a very interesting historical significance as the Red Army uh, actually passed through during the revolutionary time uh, through this county. So this county still hold this, some of the old buildings of Republican times. And even the county headquarter was in that one of that Republican uh, building. Now, what is so uh, interesting about uh, you know, this, I basically have chosen the three component to understand the rule of the poverty elevation program in this uh, uh, county. So this uh, 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 county has something like uh, 12 villages under its uh, administrative jurisdiction. And they also used to have this, I show you this, uh, you know. Um, so this is something like scenic, uh, uh, mountainous kind of a ecological uh, tourism. I mean, they are trying to make a kind of tourism site, but it's a scenic mountainous areas. And that's the reason they say that since it was not so well connected, uh, earlier, therefore the poverty still consists, but now they are trying to make it connected to the Kunming with a kind of an expressway and the highway. So there's still some areas which are not that, uh, uh, you know, the power, the benefit has not reached there. So this is a kind of a landscape you have about that county. So I'm talking about this. Uh, so this is uh, Chulung Chan. And most of this uh, township officials have this kind of a tabulation as well as a kind of a program where they try to make a, a kind of household surveys as well as uh, make a kind of a data uh, based on uh, who need help and who should be given a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, the benefit of the program. So one important uh, uh, change which the township party official told me was that unlike earlier time when they used to transfer the cash uh, to the beneficiary amount, now that approach has come to, you know, uh, there is a shift on that approach in the sense that now they no, they no longer uh, just transfer, rather they try to find out uh, what are the areas which need a kind of a uh, support. So support, there's a kind of education uh, which need to be done. So there will be educational support or there will be kind of an employment generation project or there will be kind of a, uh, you know, housing, uh, suppose somebody house has been, uh, you know, need to be constructed. So there's a kind of a, you know, special need assistance kind of a program. And in that context, the money will be used basically to, uh, construct the house or to educate the children or basically health purposes. So it will not be kind of a cash transfer, which could be used for some other purposes. Rather, it will be a kind of a specific need project, uh, uh, you know, a transfer of money. So in this, uh, uh, as I said, it's a mountainous village and where uh, the local government has basically used a three component strategy uh, to, uh, for the poverty elevation. Uh, this um, one strategy was that they tried to change the traditional small scale peasant farming into large scale commercial agrarian ventures. So you have this, you know, the, so I could not see a small scale plot in that township or county, rather it was a uh, large scale commercial um, household uh, you know, agrarian ventures. Second, what they have done, since it is a mountainous regions, they have identified the natural resource based industry so for example uh, you know tobacco or medicinal herbs herbs or fruits and flowers which could actually bring you know immediate income as well as the prosperity to the household and this uh, uh, you know natural resource based industry which was a kind of a historically as well as culturally is a uh, competitive uh, you know regional um, specificity specificities of yunnan and this has been promoted significantly by the provincial government as well as by this local government by you know creating a, a specific packages in which they encourage biodiversity product natural medicine health protection drugs uh, ornament flowers eco vegetables timber products so all have been a, a part of the uh, provincial growth strategies from 1990s and also have been uh, developed further by this uh, township and the uh, village government so what they have done 
they a they have tried to uh, make a kind of a, a partnership with the uh, investment companies and through which they try to make a kind of a transfer from the village household uh, to this agro based companies for uh, for the uh, large scale commercial ventures that is a one uh, a, you know important uh, strategy they have adopted and in this kind of a situation uh, the land has been used as a kind of a a uh, new source of creative funding so you know what is so important about the poverty alleviation program of yunna and why i have kept this local government in my title because uh, you know uh, this is a province where the uh, economic modernization as well as the poverty alleviation program have been introduced by the government um, ethnic minorities or people living in this mountainous regions or border areas or this uh, desert areas may have their own views of uh, livelihood as well as may have their own views of uh, living standard but this is the local government which is basically trying to tell them that uh, you know you need to modernize you need to become economically developed you have to change your ways of living you have to change your uh, you know model of uh, uh, earning livelihood and then inject a model of prosperity based on income changing their traditional livelihood so that is what's so different about the yunnan provincial development uh, you know strategies that so it's not that you know people won't change is basically how they have been juxtaposed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the provincial development growth in fact uh, i would say even uh, you know the during the belt and road strategies when they try to transform some of the border zones uh, you know really her cow and uh, you know other border economic zones they were all being juxtaposed as you know primitive traditional uh, no, backward and not having so much of a kind of a development vis-a-vis -vis modern development mo uh, you know economic uh, economic prosperity and a kind of a you know new uh, ways of living which the government will bring by injecting this model of development and in fact in mangla county in shishong panna for example they have also tried to change this model of development which people were engaged earlier in cultivation by saying that this is environmentally you know dangerous so you make all this kind of a notions and images and then kind of you know stereotype and basically trying to indicate that ethnic minorities culturally as well as you know uh, historically not been uh, uh, not been very much uh, contributing to the provincial development and therefore it has become the responsibility of the local government to bring changes there such an interesting point which i notice is that most of the provinces uh, uh, you know the poverty actually lies in other provinces as well so what is so unique about yunnan provincial uh, development strategy other provinces uh, even in anhui such one uh, the poorer regions have shown have witnessed a large scale migration so you have migration from the rural to urban areas or uh, intra provincial migration or the inter provincial migration or the cross provincial migration which had happened in a significant ways but in case of yunnan the interesting point is that even the inter provincial intra provincial migration is actually not much so uh, you know the whole idea is that people just uh, you know don't think that they they are you know they themselves don't consider to be poor which need to be need some kind of a help rather i would say the provincial government or the local government which is actually try to bring this idea of progress or modernization or you know this prosperity which they think the ethnic minority should be uh, you know getting into it so this is you know further uh, uh, process which i found uh, you know very interesting about this uh, yunnan province yeah so let me just you know quickly uh, talk about uh, you know a couple of things about this a the how the local government is using land pool as a new source of creative funding in rural china and in that case uh, uh, they are adopting a model of uh, commercial large scale agri land business model where uh, uh, you know as we all know that there is a kind of a shrinkage of uh, uh, farmland and that applies to even yunnan and in that case uh, they are uh, they are in fact entering into a new kind of a uh, relation between the land uh, a peasant agrarian enterprises and the state actors so you have a kind of a new relationship which emerged where uh, local government by taking the land from the peasant household provide land to this agro based companies and then this agro based companies by using their own uh, various marketing strategies as well as the marketing channels of you know uh, which enters into a kind of a new uh, food value chain 
they become a kind of a new actors. So you have the earlier, earlier actors of a state and the peasant household, which has been taken over now with a new kind of relationship, which you have with this agro-based companies, as well as the uh, you know, uh, local government becomes a important stakeholder in that. Second important point, which uh, I want to talk about, since I think these are uh, about this tobacco, because tobacco has been historically very important, uh, you know, uh, important, in fact, I would say the uh, cultural uh, you know, kind of a crop in China. And there are, in fact, books have been written talking about uh, how tobacco, tobacco was an important uh, uh, crop in, and Yunnan has an interesting comparative advantage in terms of uh, 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 tobacco leaves and the, uh, what they call as a uh, flu, um, uh, yeah. So they have flu covered tobacco and the cigarette tobacco. So this has been traditionally in industry for Yunnan. And what is so interesting about the tobacco in uh, Yunnan that it has been used as a kind of a uh, provincial uh, tax policy measures by the local government. So, uh, and also the tobacco production in Yunnan have contributed hugely, immensely to the, uh, to the uh, not only provincial government revenue, but also the central government revenue. So historically, um, I would say the provincial leaders, especially this Hu Chaozu, which I showed you in the earlier slide, played a very important role in making Yunnan. And now Yunnan is a kind of a key region in a global tobacco market. So, uh, uh, you know, the, so he, he was the one who made this, uh, Yunnan Hung Tha Group as an international player, which has now become an important brand of producing Hung Tha cigarette, uh, in, in the, which is an important uh, brand in the tobacco market. And Ho Chi Chiang, uh, so it actually goes like, you know, you take away the power from the small tobacco companies through this merging of tobacco companies into big enterprises. So this is something which happened in Yunnan and they have justified by saying that establishment of Hungtha Group signifies that Yunnan tobacco industry had developed into a new phase. So uh, they have reformed the state owned enterprises and there's a kind of interesting mix of local government, tobacco companies and peasant household. And they have expanded the scale of tobacco production so much that Yunnan Hungtha Group has become a kind of a biggest tobacco corporation in Asia. So uh, if you look at the 15 provincial level tobacco corporations, I would say Yunnan, Hunan and Shanghai contribute almost half of the total tax revenue to the entire tobacco industry. So Yunnan is in the, considered to be number one in producing this, uh, 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 you know, the, such a uh, large scale tobacco production in, in, in the province. And how it became an important player. So 82, you have this Yunnan tobacco company which was responsible for the centralized and the unified management of production, supply, and marketing. Then they have changed into a kind of a Yunnan Tobacco Monopoly Bureau. And Yunnan Tobacco Company became a part of it. And finally, uh, you know, uh, they have 1990s, they have established this STMA, State Tobacco Mon Monopoly Administration, in the local uh, areas as well. And where the, the tobacco production become more decentralized, and they have transformed the central state monopoly into this local state monopoly. So that now the local state has a more monopoly over the tobacco production than the earlier it used to be a, it used to be dominated by the central state. So in that case, if you look at it, uh, the provincial government slowly have got much freer hand in the tobacco production. And in Chulung Township, in uh, Lijiang, in Lijiang Prefecture, as well as in other parts of Yunnan as well, you have almost uh, different levels of government have contributed to six to 70% of revenue come from the tobacco industry. And last point, so, I can, uh, uh, yeah. in, just in two another minutes. five minutes, would you yes. conclude, please? Yeah. Yes, yes. Third point, which uh, last, which I want to talk about this forest area, uh, which has also have gone through significant changes uh, with this poverty elevation projects and how they have, you know, as we all know that there's a lot of questions regarding who has the forest rights registration and uh, you know the conflict about the forest land which has a lot of ambiguities between what constitute the collective rights what constitute the village rights what constitute the household enterprises so all this has been taken advantage by this uh, uh, local government and they have tried to change this entire uh, forest uh, land also into kind of a greenhouse cultivation model and also gave it to a kind of a contract to the agro-based companies. 
so basically uh, uh, since there is a kind of a uh, you know ambiguities in ownership of uh, forest land waste land auction land and which is actually creating a uh, further problems in terms of uh, you know uh, holding this kind of a asset and most of this uh, uh, land has been used by the provincial government for uh, you know for bringing a profit uh, orientation or profit venturing kind of a project so basically uh, i i just conclude by saying that uh, uh, this multinational these areas uh, you know uh, which basically uh, have come under kind of a critical inquiry by this local government where their larger agenda is basically to mainstream them into economic modernization and in that context they have been made to uh, you know uh, ensure both prosperity as well as in a way stability or what you call the harmony through this various propaganda campaign which has been uh, which has been set up by the by the by the local government and this is going to create definitely further livelihood crises as well as the further uh, you know uh, vulnerabilities or what you call the you know different inequalities further in the monetary regions just quickly i show you couple of uh, photographs uh, you know uh, this is some uh, this is the uh, chavu sun where we went so they have mobilized a lot of resources to make a kind of a village activity center uh well this was a local party secretary which was very well versed with the uh, poverty poverty alleviation schemes and policies and and he has a looks like a bright future that he was very sure that he will be going up in the hierarchy okay maybe i close here and then maybe we can come back to it later thank you thank you very much uh, ritu uh so uh very interesting um uh presentation with a lot of uh, both theoretical policy and comparative implications uh i will not uh summarize um, i will only highlight two things one uh while waiting for comments and questions one um you know the how the provincial uh development strategy uh, uh really was excluded what was was an exclusion oriented that uh, the non poor areas non uh, non poor areas became the center of uh, the development strategy and the poor regions poor people were left behind so yunnan prospers but poor regions and poor people live, uh, are left behind and this is the story you know i come from odisha this is the story from odisha this is the story in india the regional disparities and so on so that's uh, number one because uh, you know the tourism trade especially border trade and tobacco uh, that became the centerpiece in this development sense but now the uh, um, and and she very well explained the national poverty eradication scheme uh we all know that uh, the uh, the central part uh, central committee of the party has a poverty a poverty eradication uh, cell um, uh which meets i mean uh, the party secretary um, addresses um, meetings also in the, in that uh, conference and so on anyway uh and in the uh, uh the, the other interesting point is how the local government particularly some counties and this lichuan county that she has specifically studied how is focusing on a new comprehensive approach to poverty eradication uh, consisting of vocal vocational education health and employment so that is a very uh, interesting uh, development but how the mark uh, and and uh, the new actors you know the Uh, she explained this new process of uh, land um, agro based in enterprises and the government you know how this new uh, intervention is working out um and uh, uh, yet uh, and the interesting thing was how natural resources of the area are being utilized uh, to generate uh, 
income and employment. Uh, uh, on tobacco, I have some interesting questions to ask later. Um, and, uh, but um, uh, with this, I, I think we have many, many uh, interesting implications for India and uh, global poverty eradication studies. Uh, so um, I hope our discussion will be equally interesting. Uh, Srimati has her hand up, but Riza, you conduct I, uh, uh, hereafter. I will come back at the end. Sure, sir. We don't have any questions in the chat box as of yet. Uh, so, Srimati, ma'am, you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Ritu, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. We can yes. hear you. Okay. Now, somewhere in the early part of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, counties which mm -hmm. have uh, counties that have multiple uh, ethnic <coughs> minorities, uh, the state finds it difficult. The government finds it difficult to implement poverty alleviation programs. So why is that? I don't know if you may have explained it at some point, but I don't think I got registered. So why should multiple nationalities cause a problem? Because is it because you know the they might appear to be showing favoritism to one or the other or something like that? Okay, should I answer now? Uh, yes, ma'am, you could answer. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, this is, you know, uh, the classification of the poor area has been uh, has been uh, identified by the provincial government. So we don't know exactly how far these are the correct explanation. But the one reason, uh, the third classification which they have done, where they where they were talking about that there are border areas where there are a lot of minority nationalities are living, and the reason was that sometimes they find it difficult to adopt a single approach, which is normally uh, acceptable to all the ethnic minorities. And other thing is that sometimes there are so much of uh, contestation and conflict. So for example, you know, if there are two or three ethnic minorities in a region, sometimes they say the reason that why uh, poverty still persists in that region because there is no harmony in this ethnic minority. So this is official viewpoints. So the one, the you know, the because they say the one, uh, uh, one important uh, criteria is basically if you want to implement this poverty elevation program is how to convince the ethnic minorities and therefore the local government in this especially Xi Jinping time have adopted a huge mobilization. So they were asked to mobilize the cadres from the top to bottom. They were asked to talk, make a kind of a repeated visit to the household as well as they were asked to you know, talk to the minorities that this is what we are doing and it's, like, take them into confidence. But if there are too many minorities and too many ethnic population, sometimes they are cross-border ethnic population as well, where they don't think that, uh, so they have cited as a harmony, lack of harmony as one of the reason. Second reason is that if there are close to border, the cross-border kind of a, uh, you know, ethnic movement is more, uh, which is not making this ethnic, making this provincial government to adopt a single approach to these minority regions. And third, maybe, uh, because you know the, there are a lot of minorities and as Chinese government always says that they follow their own traditional as well as cultural mode of living. Sometimes it is not possible to you know, make them to accept one particular kind of a culture model, whether in terms of education or religion or you know, employment, which is acceptable to all. So there can be multiple factors in that. And other important reason is that uh, you know, they are trying to make border area as a new frontiers of capitalism. So in this new frontier of capitalism, they're trying to create a new modern approach towards urbanization, towards development, which sometimes may, may sometime not be acceptable. So there's a reallocation of minorities there. So there's a lot of tussle going on, contestation going on between ethnic minorities and, uh, and the state as well to impose one model, which may not be acceptable. And therefore they say, and the other reason I would say, the, uh, you know, the provincial governors especially in the last few years, have been very unstable terms. So after this, Pu Chaozu and Ha Chir Chiang, later on the governor's state were only continued for two years or three years. So that has been also other reason that why the development strategies in the last few years have been a little bit uh, imbalanced because they were not able to concentrate on one particular region. So there are a variety of factors 
uh, which one can think of uh, uh, explaining that. Well, thanks for your response. Uh, just uh, one brief uh, point. Are there uh, regular conflicts between these minority groups? Does that happen frequently? Uh, well, uh, Yunnan considered to be, uh, Yunnan have 25 ethnic minorities and considered to be a very peaceful province mm -hmm. in that context because they are able to impose, uh, you know, they're able to give them this dream of prosperity and uh, minorities are able to, you know, go ahead with that. But there are certain regions uh, where there is a kind of a conflict among themselves, which has been cited by the local government. We don't know. So that has been cited as one of the reason that why the poverty elevation program have not been implemented successfully. Because county also has very various layers. Township has various, various layers. So you have the vertical bureaucracy, you have the horizontal bureaucracy, and that all need to be satisfied. So sometimes they find it difficult. And also the local officials, who are the local officials? If the local officials from the same ethnic minority group, sometimes they are able to convince the population. So all these factors play an important role in that. Thank you. Ritu, it's an uh, Abhidut. Yes, hello, uh, ma'am. Hello, how are you? You know, when you were talking about Yunnan's uh, development, I could think of the tribal conditions in India during British period. You know, so at that time, the tribals rebelled. You know, that's how Birsa Munda, you know, came up and various tribal areas. Did something happen in, in Yunnan area? That is one. Secondly, you just said the ethnic minorities at the margin become poorer because of this centralized, uh, you know, development strategies. Will you include within that the women, disabled children who are more affected. So third thing is, what is the composition of local government? Thank you. Okay. All three are very important questions. Um, well, um, see, you know, this is very interesting in case of Yunnan. Um, I, you know, they have various affirmative affirmative action policies. So you have uh, various enabling institutional factors. For example, you have this uh, some kind of a reservation of seats in the higher education for ethnic minorities. Or even you know, uh, in Yunnan, they're allowing this kind of a religious practices. For example, you know, there's a lot of churches, mosques, uh, and monasteries in Yunnan, which is not the case in other provinces. So there's a kind of, you know, uh, what, what uh, uh, I'm, I'm not saying this, uh, Susan McCarthy has an entire book on this uh, uh, communist multiculturalism, uh, which I found very fascinating the approach she's taking that how uh, by designated certain regions as a autonomous prefectures, uh, the provincial government has made these minorities to live in those geographical regions. For example, you have Thai autonomous prefecture, you have this in, uh, in Nashi autonomous prefecture. And by making them to be concentrated in one geographical region, they have been also giving kind of a, a you know, preferential uh, policies mechanism. So for example, they have been also become a new site of tourism or new sites of uh, uh, economic development. So, you know, the kind of thing is like, you know, you are uh, adopting and as well as you are giving in. So there's some flexibility on the state side as well, unlike Xinjiang. But in Yunnan case, uh, there has a kind of a accommodation, so which does not lead to a kind of a uh, opposition, as you see in case of a Indian tribal group in Yunnan. Second point is that uh, in Yunnan, especially, uh, you know, we have here, uh, you know, professors working on various aspects of gender issues, uh, especially in case of, for example, Nashi women. Uh, in living in a Lichiang prefecture, they consider to be, you know, in the forefront of tourism industry in Yunnan. So uh, in that case, you have this entrepreneurial uh, kind of a skill as well as more at the forefront of uh, even uh, bringing some kind of a tourism industry at, into more profit. So women uh, will be in, uh, you know, uh, especially those who are living in the mountainous areas, E minorities, as well as other kind of minorities have been affected by this, uh, uh, schemes, but uh, they have been all given this task of uh, generating tourism as well as uh, creating new sites of uh, cooperation as such. So, um, 
so it, as i said it's a more of a incorporating and accommodating and then creating new something which very balanced approach which uh, jani state has taken in terms of a yunnan province uh, local government uh, uh, so in every township you have this uh, county and uh, township and the uh, village officials and um, I, i i think i didn't get the third question uh, perfectly of the local government at the from the from the ruling party or you know regional or the village elders real those who who think of their welfare yeah in case of uh, and yeah one important point which you raised is that uh, while uh, you know they try to make this minorities uh, accommodative the other approach is that in the appointment and the selection of the local officials they always take into account the uh, you know the ethnic minorities uh, uh, group for example in this luchan county also since it is in a, inhabited by e and miao so i could see women from e minority as a kind of a, uh, a vice governor in that county and so this is how they try to incorporate the people from the ethnic minorities in the higher level political positions which of course will be able to become a kind of a carry forward the uh policies and the program led by the central government so selection and the appointment of the local official at the county township and the regional level is a interesting point which through which also they try to create a kind of a support for their central policies uh, no okay no, no, now no. let us uh, take uh, more questions Ra, yeah Yes, sir. So we have a few questions in the chat box. So uh, as a follow up to what we have been discussing, so uh, Miss Lindsay Cook is asking. I wanted to ask if you have seen much of the local minority people's reactions to these poverty alleviation efforts and the specific support schemes such as educational training. Uh, and and okay. ma'am, we'll take a couple more from the okay. chat box, and then you could respond. Uh, there's a question by Ambassador Shokanta. how much flexibility or autonomy provincial authorities in yunnan enjoy in their poverty alleviation strategy and to what extent have uh, they have to follow the template prescribed by the central authorities hmm. atmaja gohen uh, borua has a, a follow up question i would like to uh, know how central is a state sponsored resettlement program to yunnan's poverty poverty alleviation ma'am okay. i think we could yeah take... yeah so um i could begin with the ambassador uh, kanta first um, um i think this whole question of uh, uh, central uh, directives visa with the provincial autonomy and especially after this 1994 uh, fiscal decentralization program uh, this provincial counties at the local level and the and the other form of government at the local level have been given this task of generating revenues as well as creating their fund on their own so in this uh, fiscal decentralization program they have been asked to mobilize resources and this is some uh, which i could not elaborate during my presentation uh, even this luchan county has made a kind of a linkages with the kunming production investment company in uh, at the municipal level and this kunming production investment company is generating investment and fund in this county so basically you know this county has been given taken over by this investment company to give a new look and the local government has become a new stakeholder in that so their idea is basically either through either through the land pool or through the tobacco production and tobacco production is another example where they are able to have some kind of a tax preferential policies in fact there is a debate in china that many counties are not don't want to come out or come out of this poverty cap because they think that they will not be able to get this tax preferential policies once they are removed from this poverty designated counties so this tobacco is a one important production crop which actually gives them a tax preferential policies in significant ways so it is largely left to the local areas now and that is a one important approach which xi jinping uh, has has you know formulated that let the grass leaders from the grassroots level local county township cadres etc try to mobilize resources in fact i was what i was showing through this activity center also generated through their own funding so land has become a new way of creative funding tobacco production has become a new way of creative funding as well as this uh, uh, herbal production is considered to be a 
creative funding. So this is all left to the local government to do it. Only thing is that, uh, and then they have to make an effort to prove to the national government, central government, that they have lifted this county out of poverty. And many counties have been designated by the uh, by the local uh, government as well as by the provincial government that they have been lifted out of poverty. So, so this is that's where the local government autonomy comes in. And the central government central government directive is that mobilize them and ensure that these counties should not be in the list of the poverty elevation program. So this is something you know how they're working together. So it's all about, uh, as I said, horizontal level bureaucracy and the vertical level bureaucracy, where they have to, uh, you know, and, and then they also have to generate revenues. Uh, and under this revenue generation, now they can actually keep more share of the revenue for their development. So this investment funding has become a new area where the Tifang uh, Chengfu, what they call as the local government, can play a kind of creative, creative role in doing that. So that's systematically they, they are doing. But the party secretary in this county was very much well versed with, uh, with the Xi Jinping's poverty elevation program. And they have been giving a series of training sessions, uh, as well as you know the uh, lot of education campaign, awareness program. So they were all told that you know what they have to do for the poverty elevation. And this has been uh, you know, become a kind of a, and once you do it, then it becomes a part of a promotion strategy as well as a removal strategy. So those who do well, they will be promoted to the higher level thing. So this is how the control mechanism works in that case. Um, um, the sentiment part. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Um, uh, when I was uh, visiting this Luchan County, I mean, uh, the main idea was basically to showcase these ethnic minorities who can uh, do singing and dancing and uh, uh, you know other kind of a cultural uh, program for the uh, for the outsiders and as we all know uh, in china they have this uh, Chiala, you know the weekend uh, kind of a program where most of the city dwellers will be going to the villages and they will be enjoy the life of the villagers so, so this kind of an entertainment program has been done uh, by the uh, local government as well and uh, these minorities were made to, uh, you know, so it all depends between the party secretary and the communities. So the local communities uh, were made to believe that uh, their income generation projects will be helpful for them uh, as they can, you know, make their children to, to get a higher education and as well as to, you know, make them a prop better living. But I don't think that uh, this is what the ethnic minorities want. Because uh, uh, you know, traditionally, if you look at in Yunnan, uh, ethnic minorities have their own base of you know cultural cultural lifestyle, but they have been made to do that, and they have been juxtaposed as a kind of a you know traditional versus modern, backward versus you know primitive. So uh, you, you, I mean, you're right. They have been chosen as a kind of you know new forms of uh, capital generation project, and uh, there is not uh, much voices uh, in that sense from ethnic minorities uh, in the sense that they have been uh, just made to believe that what is what is happening for them is good for them. So the dream of the dream of prosperity uh, goes much wider. Rija, there was uh, one more question about this reallocation, right? Uh, Ma'am, there was a question from Lindsay Cook regarding uh, you know, what you saw, you know, uh, if you have seen much, much of the local minority people's reactions to these uh, poverty elevation efforts and specific yeah, and educational people. training, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I have written and I have actually presented one paper on vocational training program. So, um, uh, you know, they, there is a series of uh, vocational training training programs conducted in these regions, as well as in other parts of Yunnan, uh, where and also the uh, uh, employment generation and there was a primary school so even in this uh, township level uh, which is not that uh, back which is not that uh, rich i was surprised to see a quite a good uh, you know uh, well built primary school basically for children at least you know till uh, till eighth till what you call you know 14 years 15 years kind of age group there was a good primary school in that village as well so primary and then uh, there was series of effort have been done to health checkup of the children. There were series of camp, which was done through them because now they say that uh, money is not a problem because the investment company is generating a lot of money uh, to do all that program. And also uh, they are also mobilizing the party leaders, you know, the people who served in the party at some point of time, elders, 
to donate or to you know give some kind of a social service project by donating some part of their you know uh, earlier uh, property as well as some other schemes to which can be used for this kind of a project so there is a kind of you know the entire mobilization uh, campaign to generate resources and vocational education was a important uh, part of that um, in some part you know for example they had this uh, uh, the the how different kind of skills can be generated which can be used for that so vocational education was done systematically there was series of camp as well as program uh, done by the provincial government um ma'am we have two more questions uh, there's a raised hand from dr iram ashraf and then i think uh, ms shruti jargat could ask her question yeah dr iram ashraf ah uh, thank you very much thank you very much dr agarwal for a very fascinating presentation i really enjoyed it um the question i had in mind was recently um president xi jinping in in his new put forward way um has spoken about learning from some of the mistakes from his um, speeding off of this poverty alleviation projects in, in parts of china so for example desperate local cadres have to um, to show that they have um, improved or alleviated poverty have literally physically moved people out of areas um in order to fulfill his criterion on a you know on the centenary goal and everything um and i was wondering did you come across any such examples because for me it was interesting that it was even acknowledged at that xi jinping level that there were problems created because he was um he wanted to speed it up uh, secondly on a very lighter note um i i i learned i learned a lot about poverty alleviation project from a recent chinese drama the mining town and i was just wondering with your experience being there how close do you think it was because it wasn't easy if you look at the the, the whole series the way it was projected um i i i i don't think we can you know we have to honor the the whole way the project was enacted by the individuals even the locals so that's my question thank you very much um well um iram right so uh, i think i will be actually agreeing with you i, I mean i'm i'm not saying that uh, what went ahead with the xi jinping's idea of uh, poverty alleviation lead to a complete success it may have uh, show some it may show some result at least for the county where i went for some years uh, because you know they have taken a huge land pool uh, making people to live there the idea was in luchuan county was basically not people to leave that area because that was close to the city and they could connect it to the khunmei but you are right maybe in other regions and in fact i have also seen the uh, the news item where they have reallocated uh, the entire uh, uh, you know the farm household as well as the people living in the city regions to some other areas just to show that poverty has been alleviated so you are right there is a lot of loopholes and uh, the policy package the way it has been uh the way it has been implemented or formulated left much to the uh, local level officials as well to interpret so uh, there are all these issues but in the initial level and since uh, maybe it is possible for the local government to do it they may do it uh, in the successful but as i said even this was not a great success in the sense that it has compromised the livelihood livelihood issues it has compromised the land issues it has compromised the peasant autonomy it has compromised the ethnic minorities uh, uh, you know the right to their land the forest etc so it, there is a compromise and there is a kind of a uh, you know uh, taking away those rights from this uh, different groups as such so even this is not a success only thing is that they try to do it by again making income generation as a kind of a, their in, their main criteria but what impact it has in the larger term of course there are a lot of issues with that because when they use a lot of fertilizers and pesticides and they try to create crop uh, production in a limited uh, amount of time it bound to have an impact or it bound to leave land infertile for years so this is all these issues are there even serious implication it has on this uh, uh, on these regions as well so uh, the whole idea was that uh, as i said uh, you know the even initially the poverty uh, was not been taken seriously uh, in the sense that it was not uh, you know the main where does the poverty lies is not been taken into account 
and the entire approach was not internally uh, driven or not only micro development. For example, the focus was more on highway construction, but the focus was not on connecting villages to the cities or township to the cities. So th this was not a part of your non-development strategy earlier. So all this, so you cannot bring a new city all of a sudden, but that's what they're trying to do. Uh, most of these uh, border areas, they are trying to bring economic zones and try to bring a kind of a new connectivity, but how long it will actually, uh, you know, can revamp the entire uh, region in such a way that uh, it will have a large scale, uh, um, you know, the benefit, benefits for the population. I mean, one doesn't have, one just have to see. So I, I actually go, uh, you know, I largely agree with you that, you know, the problems are with the entire policy pa packages, which are looking only for the short-term benefits and not looking for the long-term implication of these projects. Uh, Ma'am, we can take one final question and then I'll hand it over to Professor Mohanty. Uh, there's a question in the chat box by Shruti Jagat. Uh, her question is, increased control over bureaucrats via anti-corruption corruption campaigns and cadre evaluation has created the perception that innovation and risk-taking has been stifled. Is that the case with the poverty elevation programs as well, particularly in schemes involving market actors? Yeah. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, what I noticed, uh, um, you're right, this anti-corruption campaign was very much uh, taken seriously during that time. So what they have done, they have added a new, uh, uh, I will not say, I mean, new institution uh, or new uh, kind of a uh, bureau there, which is called a supervision bureau. So there was a, you know, when we were talking to village party officials, there was this uh, party official came and he says that, you know, you cannot do anything without my approval. So he, people say, oh, he's very powerful because he's from the Supervision Bureau. So Supervision Bureau has been added uh, to this uh, uh, new power television program, basically to see that uh, how much uh, fundraising has been done, how the fund has been utilized, what has been the financial investment uh, in the region. Uh, that is one. And secondly, uh, China is still have, uh, you know, the uh, earlier practice of uh, socialist type, which I noticed in my, uh, you know, uh, county visit you know, where people of all village had officials, they sit together and uh, try to have a kind of a, uh, you know, talk and all those kind of a, uh, you know, eating together, meeting together and, uh, uh, and you know, this toasting together is very much part of uh, even this, uh, uh, you know, uh, minor, as well as the village culture and the uh, rural area culture, even in Yunnan. So this uh, supervision uh, thing is very important. And then how they create a kind of a, as I said, the communism ways of, uh, you know, living in the sense of, you know, eating, uh, you know, talking and uh, toast, toasting together is, is still a part of the uh, Chinese village officials culture, which is still can play important role in dealing with this bureaucracy to a large extent, um, especially at the local level. And when they go further to the provincial and the municipal level, this all goes by the party secretaries, and you're right, the party secretaries who have some kind of a, uh, what you call them, uh, they have they have been a kind of a, uh, they have you know, some kind of a upper hand in the provincial bureaucracy or in the, uh, in the upper bureaucracies, of course, they will be protected by the, by, by this uh, higher level government of authority. So that is very much there uh, in, in that case, but, uh, they basically they they work at the local government level. They work together, uh, either to uh, implement a kind of program or to basically uh, suggest that uh, the, what has been generated should not. But there is a corruption itself because also because all these party secretaries and the, and the local level officials were actually um, having these uh, big cars and uh, you know which have taken me to all these places. And God, one wonders that from where these cars have come from. So all this happens under this local level politics. And people say that regions which are uh, far from the central government, the, 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 the things don't reach faster from there. I mean, they are less, uh, con less uh, you know, controllable by the central government. So this is also, you know, the, the phrases goes there, the kind of a thing that, you know, the more, the far you are from the, far away you are from the central government, uh, you will be less, you know, less controlled by the central government. So you have all this, uh, you are right, that you have all this kind of a uh, politics which work together, supervision, but you have this corruption. 
you have the financial investment coming in, which is difficult to believe that local officials will not be a stakeholder in that. So you are right, but they, they know that how to figure it out. But only thing is that uh, since uh, the, you know, the reports have been sent uh, and uh, there was a kind of a time bound project. So after this time is over, we, I mean, the time bound project have this kind of problems. What is the long-term implication of this project? Yeah, I could see, sir. No, are there more questions? <laughs> no, sir. No, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ritu. Uh, first, on a lighter uh, side, uh, tobacco economy, uh, which is flourishing. <laughs> uh, and you said, uh, Yunnan, um, uh, was it Honan and, uh, and then Shanghai, the three of them uh, are the tobacco producers <laughs> uh, yes. to the world. Uh, I'm a non-smoker. I think so are you. <laughs> and uh, um, I mean, Mao said him to uh, Tang Xiaoping, yeah. they were all great smokers. And after Smoke. that, I did an anti-smoking campaign. <laughs> I don't know what that. Uh, I, was, I was thinking, you know, Mao always used to offer cigarette to the his friends and whosoever exactly. used to visit him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, I, I hope uh, they know the other uses of tobacco for uh, medicines, spices, uh, so many other things. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so, they, I, I hope uh, they have a tobacco research and innovation <laughs> uh, center. Okay. Uh, two things are very striking. Um, I think uh, still... Uh, the income generation is the focus. Mm -hmm. uh, the ways of uh, doing it uh, have changed, but uh, from your account and also from other accounts, uh, one sees that uh, income generation is the focus. And um, of course, the centrally monitored or centrally designed uh, a strategy of income generation uh, also accompanies a recommendation for locally applicable strategies, just as in Yunnan or in county specific, even Xiang uh, specific uh, <coughs> income generation. Uh, in other words, the differentiated approach to poverty eradication is still lacking. In other words, uh, for example, women uh, mm. suffer from greater poverty than men all over the world. And there are poverty estimates to that extent. Uh, and more so in developing countries, both in India and China. And uh, so the, uh, um, so whether, uh, you know, uh, gender and poverty studies, um, I think uh, <coughs> we would like more um, data and analysis insights uh, into that because uh, when they move from traditional uh, uh, occupations to modern occupations, uh, agriculture, forestry, or uh, some of the traditional uh, production systems to modern, uh, in the enthusiasm of profit, uh, some of the traditional functions of women also get replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, women uh, lose even uh, their traditional uh, role and sources of income. Uh, of course, some of them get uh, all, uh, skills and training and get uh, observed in the new system. So this is my first comment that uh, poverty eradication in China still is income generation focused rather than differentiated and um, Yes, the income generation is now tuned towards natural resource base or sustainable uh, dimension, uh, things like that, but, uh, but not uh, in terms of social differentiation. That's my first point. Second, uh, in the transition from uh, state to the market or to state market uh, jointly uh, running the economy and uh, 
the whole society. Uh, uh, it seems that still the um, government plays the principal role. Though you have mentioned the uh, agro-based enterprises, which are, I'm sure, market-oriented uh, enterprises. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, even though you didn't discuss this dimension very much, uh, the uh, private initiative still plays a very important role uh, in the Yunnan economy, especially during the last uh, uh, 25 years or so because uh, you, uh, Kun, uh, Kunming and also Yunnan's prosperity as a whole, um, even though it is state-led still, has encouraged uh, entrepreneurial development, uh, including uh, national Ch Chinese, uh, national level capital uh, coming into, uh, into Yunnan. Uh, so the, uh, uh, in this case, what I would like to, um, see in further research is, uh, is the uh, are the entrepreneurs mostly just making a quick buck uh, or are committed to poverty eradication in the new frame of gender sensitivity, uh, multiple exclusion sensitivity, sustainability, and so on. This is my second point. My final comment is, uh, uh, by the way, in the second point, I would like to also mention the role of NGOs in poverty eradication. I think uh, this sector has grown tremendously. These are the faithful, cooperative, uh, complementary NGOs, not the uh, <laughs> critical NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, the few of which uh, still exist in India. Um, uh, and uh, in China, it, these are the so. Uh, they are this sort of semi-entrepreneurial NGOs uh, and they uh, enjoy the flexibility and state patronage and they play a very important role, at least in some of the other uh, ethnic areas, they play a very important role. Finally, I am very upset by the poverty discourse in China being fully integrated with the ethnic minority discourse. Uh, it's a problem of uh, backward ethnic people, uh, you know, ha having historical and structural uh, drawbacks, and that being the being the cause of their poverty. Sorry, I have studied, uh, you know, in the richest province, one of the richest provinces of China, uh, Shanxi. Uh, sorry, not Shanxi. Um, no, no, no. Uh, our, um, yeah, in the Wuxi region, you see the, um, the uh, Jiangsu province is one of the richest, and north of Yangtze and south of Yangtze. South of Yangtze is uh, very, you know, Sunan uh, is very rich. North of Yangtze has many poor villages, Han poverty, Han people being poor. So poverty is not a back is not a backward ethnic uh, ethnically backward region. But most, so uh, no, no, that is the perception. That is the perception, and your definition of uh, this income uh, best uh, uh, definition also makes it so even more. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's not the um, even though. Uh, you know, these are also na natural resource rich provinces, Xinjiang and so on, uh, even Yunnan, natural resource rich provinces. Uh, therefore, the uh, provincial per capita is high, but the income in specific counties and poor regions is low. Therefore, my final point would be don't associate poverty with ethnic minorities. It so happened, happens that. Uh, uh, some of them remain poor, yes, but uh, that's for uh, the same reasons that that are also available in the Han poor areas. Well, it has been a fascinating uh, uh, discourse. Thank you very much, uh, Ritu, and we look forward to this project seeing many, many new heights, new publications. Thank you very much.
And thanks for the discussion, the questioners. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you everyone at ICS. Uh, and I'm sure you know that there's a lot of good, interesting thoughts which one could engage with. And uh, interesting discussion, which actually I was looking forward to. 